computers are now the best chess players in the world. They're better workers, they're better players, they're better drivers. Will they soon be better doctors, better scientists, better politicians? Well, we don't know, but in about 10 years' time, computers will reach brain power, and that has fundamental implications for our future. We already see that as actually computational power is increased, as cybercrime increases too. By now, actually, $3 trillion per year is actually wasted on cybercrime, or lost on cybercrime. But there are even bigger problems. Because our society, our economy, is fundamentally changing, that has great benefits, but also comes with great challenges. We see that, for example, the way we educate is changing, the way we do research, the way we move, we go shopping, we produce. Our health system is going to change dramatically with personalized health. Uh, politics, most likely too, the economy, the financial business, insurance business, and even war. So we need to prepare ourselves to think differently, to think about a different future. And some of the implications are related, of course, to our job market. Now, back in 1850s, most people have been working in the agricultural sector. That has really dramatically declined by now. About 3-5% of people are working in the agricultural sector. But then an industrial revolution took place, the steam engine was invented and other kind of automation, and that created new kinds of jobs after a difficult initial period. And later on, a third sector, the service sector came up, that's the green curve over here. But now, actually, we're facing the birth of a fourth digital sector sector of information and knowledge production, and that's the red curve. Now, why is this dramatic? Because each of the transitions between an economy dominated by one sector and an economy dominated by another sector came with a lot of hiccups and difficulties, and so we need to prepare ourselves well to make this a smooth transition into a better future. In particular, we need to be aware that about 50% of industrial jobs will be lost on automation. And then agriculture plus industry is less than 10%. And in the service sector in the next 20 years or so, you'll also lose about 50% of jobs. And then altogether, all three original sectors, agriculture, industry, and service will be less than 50% of jobs, that means 50% or more of jobs will have to be created in the digital economy. And the question is, how will we do this? And we already see the implications. In some European countries, the unemployment rates are skyrocketing. This is a use unemployment. You see in some countries, it's about 50% already. So this is already happening. And as a consequence, some companies went bankrupt, even though Kodak actually owns most of the digital camera patents in the world. It couldn't transform itself quickly enough into a modern digital business. And cities have difficulties too to adapt. So you can see Detroit used to be a big automobile city, is in really bad shape. And actually, our, our budget, our government budgets are in bad shape, too. So in most industrialized countries, actually, we have debt levels of 100 or 200 percent of GDP per capita. So the question is, how long will we be able to pay for this? It seems like we really have to think about a new system, a new way of doing business, a new way of organizing our society. So the question is, should we spend our money on fixing the old system, or should we spend it to build a better future, a new system?
And so, as we have done public investment for agriculture, and we are doing public investments for the industry sector, such as public roads, for example. We are also doing public investment into the service sector, such as schools and universities. We'll have to make investments into the digital sector, too. And the question is, what are the new infrastructures and institutions that we would need to support? And here is one proposal, I think, which is at the heart of this future digital society. We should create a planetary nervous system as a citizen web. And that would be an intelligent level on top of the Internet of Things. And this can be done now. Of course, all it takes is you and your smartphone. Of course, we can connect all these smartphones together to create a global measurement system. In each smartphone, there are more than 10 sensors, you know, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, light sensors, and all sorts of things. So what can we use it for? We can do a lot of things. We can measure the entire world in the future even more so. But if you want to do this with our own smartphones, then we need to build a system that we can trust. Otherwise, we wouldn't open up the data streams for others. So it needs to be a system that's controlled by us. It will be important to have really the informational self-determination at the center of the system. So we'll allow you to determine yourself which sensors to open up, whether you would use them just for your own measurements or you would share this data with others. In perspective, you should also be able to determine whom to share the data with for what purpose. And that requires a certain management of privacy and data ownership, such as a personal data store as developed by MIT and others, uh, Open CDS, for example. And there, basically, all the data generated about you would be sent into an own data mailbox in a sense. And that would allow you to manage your own data. Now, if we build on top of this a micropayment system, that will allow everyone to establish a own business. And the system would also support, of course, collaboration with others. So together we could grow a really powerful information innovation and production ecosystem. And that would enable everyone to do new kinds of things, come up with new services and products that would create all these new jobs. And you said that, well, enabling users, customers, and citizens will lead to better services, better products, better businesses, better neighborhoods smarter cities and smarter neighborhoods. So let's do this together. Uh, let's build a participatory system, something like an open data source, together as a real-time open data stream that we would generate for our purposes. And so the principle would be to give and take. You can Take data for your own purposes as you need it, for science, for business, for politics, for whatever purpose. But of course, the system would only work if you share that. So we need your data too for this to work. And in a similar way, we should share source codes too. First of all, to know what's really happening on our smartphone, that means it needs to be transparent, to be trustful. The other advantage is that this would really build this joint innovation ecosystem. So you could download certain kinds of computer code to do your own measurements as you need it. Perhaps it turns out it's not exactly doing what you want it to do, but of course it's open source. You can sit together with your colleagues or friends and change a source code to adapt it to your own needs. 
and then you would upload it to make it available to other people. And they could change it again and change, share it back. And in this way, we would grow this powerful information and innovation ecosystem. Now, the important point here is that this wouldn't just be an app. As you can download millions of apps on your smartphone. The point is that most apps are pretty constrained in terms of what you can do with them. Usually there are no data flows between different kinds of apps. Here you would have all sorts of freedoms. You, know, you could use these data as you like it. You could come up with your own ideas how to use the data. You could come up with games and all sorts of uh, useful things. And here's just one example for a very simple game to solve conflict and offense. So assume we have two groups of people and they cannot agree on something, like what TV program to watch or what pizza to order. And then we came up with a virtual arm wrestling over here using the accelerometer sensors in the smartphone. So let's see what happens here. So they don't agree, there are two teams, and now they're going to actually compete with each other. <coughs> And in the end, of course, uh, one team will win. But the main point is here, you know, while you could download such a game, you could create your own games, really, with this system. And so that would be the power of the billion brains on this earth that would be unleashed by such a system. So in particular, what can we do with the planetary nervous system? It has a number of different application areas. So first of all, real-time measurement of the world. Second, once we know what's going on in the world, it creates greater awareness of the implications of our decisions and actions, of risk and opportunities. We can use this information we learn about the world uh, to create a global system of science that allows us to understand why certain things are happening. And we can build self-realizing systems and finally collective intelligence. And let me zoom a little bit into this. So certainly we need to have more awareness about the situation we're in. Because we're doing so many mistakes in the world, uh, we could avoid many of them. So we should and we could build new compasses for decision makers. These compasses would measure not just GDP per capita, they would measure also things we can see, like social capital, reputation, trust, solidarity, compliance, or happiness. We could map the environmental change and who causes it. We could map resources and who uses them. We could map prices together. And many other things. We can actually map the world in 3D just with the photos that everyone is uploading every day. Now, the, the important point is that with all this information, we can also advance science, and in particular complexity science and global system science, because now everything is interconnected. We really need to learn about how our planet changes and why. And let's start simple. So by now there are models of traffic congestion, a problem that's still not solved, but I will show later on that there are new solutions actually on the surface. Pedestrian flows and crowd disasters, social influence and opinion formation, all of this is now much better understood. Coordination problems, cooperation problems, the evolution of moral behavior, the evolution of social preferences. All of that is now understood. The emergence of social norms and the occurrence and spreading of conflict and new ways of fighting them. Finally, epidemic spreading and the spreading of ideas in the world. These are just a few examples from my own work. And of course, there is a huge community of people who are producing many more interesting results. 
So the main point here is once we understand how social systems work, what are the hidden forces behind change in our world, we can use these forces for us. So it would work a similar to Asian martial arts in a sense. At the moment, often we are fighting the system because we don't understand how it works. Now we should learn to use the forces to our own advantage, as we do it in a motor, right? So every minute there are several thousand explosions in a motor, but we have learned to control these explosions to produce a direct motion. And we can do this very same thing with our economy and our society too, if we just understand these forces. And what it takes is to create feedback cycles in the right way, once we have the information. <coughs> Besides the parental nervous system, in order to learn how these feedbacks have to be created, it's good to have interactive virtual worlds that allow us to test different kinds of feedback mechanisms and interaction mechanisms, so we could test in advance how this system decides to work. So I'd like to claim that 300 years after its invention, we can make the invisible hand work by combining the Internet of Things with principles of self-organization. So to really unleash the full potential of the Internet of Things, we need to understand complex designs. And here is an example. So we're setting out here by simulating the annoying stop and go traffic that we're suffering from every, every day, basically. And once uh, we have understood this, and so that's what the simulation video shows that we do understand it before we can simulate it, um, we will change the traffic situation, as I will show you in a few seconds. So first of all, let us elevate ourselves out of this car in order to see what's really <coughs> producing these stop and go waves. So there's a few cars that are trying to get themselves into the freeway. This produces small disruptions. These disruptions are amplified, and finally that produces a stop and go wave. Now assume that we would equip the vehicles with radar sensors that measure the distance and relative velocity between cars and that we would use this information to let the car self-drive. We've done that actually 10 years ago. And uh, as you can see over here, this can be done in a way that is not just improving the comfort of driving, but it's actually stabilizing traffic flow and increasing capacity. So with real-time feedback, we can fix the problem. The same thing can be done in industry. So again, 10 years ago, we came up with self-organizing production methods based on agent-based principles. It can be even used to basically to set up self-organizing uh, production plants and to test out many different well, if you want to think big, if we can build a traffic assistance system to overcome congestion, considering that, in a sense, recessions and booms, you know, this is a stop and go wave in our world economy, could we also create an assistance system for our world economy? And I think so. I think this can actually be done, and so we done computer simulations of the world economy to understand business cycles. And we can also show that by changing the network structure, for example, or by reducing time delays in response to changes in the markets, you can stabilize the system. We just need this information. We can also overcome annoying congestion in our cities. So what we've done here, again, we have applied the self-organization principle, and that was inspired actually by oscillations in flows as we find them in pedestrian flows and bottlenecks. So this looks like there would be a traffic light, but there is not. It's based on a pressure principle. 
So what we've done is, rather than controlling traffic flows by traffic lights, we let the traffic flows, rather than traffic lights controlling the traffic flows as we do it today, we let the traffic flows control the traffic lights. And that is creating beautiful green waves and great benefits for motorized traffic, public transport, pedestrian and cyclists, and the environment too. So this is much more efficient, you know, in the very same way as markets are more efficient than a planned economy. So in conclusion, we could say a suitable feedback to measurements of external effects can make the invisible hand work. And now the exciting question is, can we build a system systems for cooperation too? That means for social and economic systems. And the answer is yes, I believe so. And one of these feedback systems is actually uh, what we know from the web as reputation systems. So it's spreading what, like wildfire because it's so useful. It's useful for customers because it's uh, giving them a better service, a better quality. But also producers and sellers are benefiting from this because they can learn more on their products if they have a higher reputation. But we can do more than this. We can create <coughs> digital assistance. We can create social and social inspired technologies to address a number of problems that we're facing every single day. So assume two people or two companies are interacting with each other. Then there are basically four kinds of situations. A lose-lose situation, that should be avoided, right? A win-win situation, that's good, so we should engage in this. Maybe just we can improve fairness so um, everyone is gaining a similar amount, uh, depending, of course, on effort. Then there are bad win-lose situations. In this case, one party is interested in engaging in this. And however, that would exploit the other party, so that other party would like to be protected. Altogether, this interaction would create a damage for our goal. Of course, this would be uh, altogether negative. But there are also good win-lose situations where one side would win, the other side would lose. But if we would engage all together, that would create an improvement. Now, how to make this other side that would lose interested in this interaction well, this can be done by value transfer, so it becomes a win-win situation. And in fact, we could build social technology to a digital assistant that would do that for us, that would support us in getting uh, situational awareness, in identifying opportunities we would otherwise miss, in avoiding risks that we should actually avoid. Uh, they could support us in uh, engaging in interactions more beneficially. Uh, they could help to protect us and they could also support us in value transfer. And together we can build a more resilient, smarter society too. So let's go back to the sensors in our smartphone. Uh, we can in particular measure acceleration. Right? What could we do with this? Well, in particular, if all these smartphones start shaking, you know, that probably means that there's an earthquake. So we could use this to warn our friends and families and colleagues automatically. Our smartphone would send out a warning to our contact list. Uh, that, that can be arranged. And then how would you respond? Well, I've been in the Silicon Valley, actually, some time back, and we organized a hackathon on earthquake resilience. 90 people came, and it was really extremely interesting what they came up with. And here are the three winning projects that show that there are completely new possibilities actually um, to respond to disaster. So this is the first application that has been proposed by one of the team, Amigo Cloud. This allows you to take pictures of a broken bridge or a damaged building or whatever and annotate it. 
And uh, as soon as you have connectivity, this would be uploaded to the web. So the disaster response team of the government would know what the situation is, even before they can send their own people to this place. But the neighbors would know this too. So that would be available within minutes or hours, you know, where useful information can help really uh, to use the limited forces much better. Now, the problem is would your communication system work? And in many cases, uh, the centralized communication infrastructure is not working well. So the good point, though, is that um, smartphones can also be operated with a talk network. So they would just talk to each other. And in fact, fire chat is now making this possible. So we wouldn't need this centralized infrastructure. We just need electricity. And this is actually what charge beacons is for. So these are solar panels, you know, autonomous system that would allow people in the neighborhood to charge their smartphones. They would meet each other and talk about the situation and also arrange help. And finally, there is this app, Helping Hands, that would uh, support people in helping each other. So you could say, I, I need some food for my baby, or I, I need some support for my grandmother, or I need some water, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And other people would be able to help. And so we could actually match need and supply in a way that in the neighborhood, people could help each other much more efficiently. And that means we wouldn't have to wait for the public disaster response team to be there now people could already help each other much earlier. So that would be much more effective and in perspective, of course, we could apply it not only in disaster response, we could make our everyday life more resilient by using these kinds of tools every day. And finally, of course, uh, we'd like to build collective intelligence. I think this is really important that we learn how to bring the best ideas of many minds together. And there is an interesting exercise that has been done that's pretty surprising. <laughs> that's the uh, Netflix challenge. Netflix uh, wants people to be happy about the movies uh, the customers are seeing. So all the movies are being rated and customers get recommendations. But it turns out that even though big data analytics is around, it is very difficult really to make a good uh, recommendation. And so they wanted to have a better recommender system said it's worth a million if you come up with a 10% better system, just 10%. And it took two years and none of the teams, although there were hundreds of teams and thousands of solutions proposed, none of them managed to, to reach this margin. <coughs> Then one day, the leading team decided to team up with other teams that were apparently not as good as they were with their solutions. And they averaged over their solutions. You would think, okay, if you average the best solution with solutions that are worse, that will produce uh, certainly not a better solution. But this is what happened. It was the best solution, and it won. So the conclusion is that not the best wins, it's diversity that wins. Diversity is extremely important to unleash the wisdom of crowds. And here is another proof for this. This has been an analysis of economic systems around the world. It turns out the most successful, most developed economies are the most diverse economies. So diversity is highly important. And now the question is, how will the economy look like in the digital age? Well, certainly you will have more automation of procedural and routine jobs. We'll have more information knowledge production, personalized products, and therefore hyper variety markets, more creative jobs, network thinking, relationships of businesses with suppliers and customers to be more successful than your competitors. Then a uh, sh sharing economy, then competition, co-learning, co-innovation, co-creation, um, 
you'll have an information, innovation, and production ecosystem. So in a sense, you know, it, it all comes together. And we'll have prosumers and co-producing consumers. Uh, we see that already in smart grids, uh, in peer-to-peer uh, -peer business, and so on. We have more home production with 3D printers, bottom-up participation, new forms of work, and we see that already with Amazon Mechanical Turk and so on. Uh, much more short-term commitments and projects to be more flexible, and a modular organization of projects, such that they form a network of projects, and altogether more decentralization, more distribution, and more self-organization. That's what I believe will happen. Finally, how can we create new value? As I said, uh, the shorter money, in a sense, uh, but data can be turned into value, even into gold, and Bitcoin has shown that this is really possible. You know, An old stream of humanity has become true. You can basically create money from almost nothing, from digits. Now, this doesn't solve this whole problem of tragedies of the commons, though. And the question is, how can we overcome this problem? And we've been thinking about this, how to turn the downward spiral that would lead to the tragedies of the commons into an upward spiral. So basically, competition would lead towards a trend to the better. And in fact, this is possible. And I came up with an idea that I call social money, and some of that relates actually to reputation systems or to a system that we call marriage-based matching. So in a social dilemma situation that would lead to the tragedy of the commons, usually the stable solution is the undesirable one, the non-cooperative solution. Well, the cooperative solution that we'd like to have that would be better for everyone is unstable. As the smooth traffic flow also has been unstable and produced the stop and go traffic. Now, can we build this assistance system for cooperation? And in fact, if we match those people who are more cooperative with other cooperative people, and those people who are less cooperative with less cooperative people, this is what we call merit based matching, they're not only uh, does cooperation suddenly pay off for cooperators? It also creates a trend to the better, so uh, people would altogether become more cooperative. And not only this, even though it's a merit based mechanism, interestingly enough, in our laboratory experiment, we find that this is also reducing the level of inequality. So Efficient, in, uh, efficiency and equality are not contradictory. We can build an economy which is both efficient and is not promoting inequality. So with all these benefits, it's time to get ready for this. Please team up with us to work with us on these challenges for the future. Join the NervousNet community and let's make the magic happened together. Thank you very much.